extraordinary potential. So uh, most open access journals have APCs um, that are in the thousands of dollars uh, and can be as much as around 9,500 euros for the, um, <clears throat> as we know, for some, uh, from some recent nature deals. Read and publish deals um, that are also based around APCs tend to also serve primarily the interests of authors that are affiliated with wealthy institutions. And if we're looking to build um, equitable open access systems that are inclusive, um, we also need to think about the impacts that, that these models have on researchers around the world. And um, as we know, re <coughs> APCs can represent a major impediment to researchers in developing countries. There was a fantastic piece. Um, I'd encourage uh, you to read it um, in um, Science Editor, which is just from a couple of days ago. I'm happy to, um, to uh, put it on blast here. It's called Left in the Cold, um, the failure of APC waiver programs to provide author equity that also go through some of the issues around um, APC waivers um, for uh, researchers in low and middle income countries. Um, Romy Beard, uh, who contributes to this piece, um, highlights how, you know, even with discounts, APCs remain too expensive for researchers in the developing world. Um, they're typically, APC waivers are typically poorly communicated. There's low awareness of their availability. They're not automatically applied. The terms can change unexpectedly. Um, and typically hybrid journals are excluded from those programs. Um, waivers are also inconsistently applied. So um, although they um, researchers from some parts of the world are eligible um, based on uh, their status as LMICs. Um, researchers from other LMICs aren't um, eligible um, and simply because of kind of publisher exclusions. The, um, the piece that I always kind of try to focus on is the equity piece and, and also the dignity piece, which is that waivers don't really treat researchers in the um, developing world as equal participants and rather ask them um, to be recipients of charity. Um, and I think if we, if we are going to build systems that are equitable, we need to confer dignity to all participants. So as we um, <clears throat> talk about open access and particularly non-APC based approaches, um, we start getting into discussions around knowledge and the knowledge commons. And the idea that knowledge should belong in the commons obviously has strong historical roots, um, but there were a number of uh, scholars that kind of challenge this notion. And I think, you know, most of us have, um, in some point in our academic careers, um, been introduced to the tragedy of the commons, a, a piece by Garrett Hardin, which was published in Science in 1968. And the tragedy of the commons, um, you know, was something that really, I think, shaped thinking around around commons and of the knowledge commons and where, where Garrett Hardin mentions that ruin is a destination towards all men rush each pursuing his own best interest in, in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons and that freedom in a commons brings ruin to all I thought it was important to actually note you know who Garrett Hardin was and where this messaging was really coming from um, this is from the Southern Poverty Law Center um, that actually mentions that you know, Garrett Hardin, although he was a professor at UC Santa Barbara, he used a veneer of intellectual and moral legitimacy for his underlying nativist agenda. Um, he was, a, he was uh, an anti-immigrant um, uh, advocate and a white nationalist. And so um, if you kind of think about how his scholarship and this idea of the tragedy of the commons, I'm not saying that the tragedy of the commons is, is inevitable. Um, his, uh, you have to kind of understand the, the rationale or, or his ideological position where he was coming from. Thankfully, there are uh, some wonderful scholars who since have uh, debunked this orthodox view. And um, the two really important ones to mention are Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, who um, mentioned that, of course, exploitation of the commons resources is not inevitable. The communities are able to develop and sustain commons based on trust, cooperation, and reciprocity. And Carol Rose, um, who's a professor of law and organization at Yale Law School, who mentions that um, 
in the commons, a comedy of the commons can ensue where resources can become more useful the more people use them. And that's really what we hope to try and achieve in, in open access. But it's true that when you're talking about um, knowledge as a public good, um, free writing can become uh, a legitimate issue. Um, it is not inevitable though. And um, in the logic of collective action, Manker Olson argues that there are a number of different mechanisms to sustain public resources. Um, the first is that small groups of institutions can collaborate to provide resources that serve their needs, even if those institutions beyond, even if institutions beyond the group benefit from that investment. You can leverage group affinity and social incentives to encourage pro collective behavior, and you can also induce institutions to participate through economic self-interest. So based on this collective action theory, um, I'm going to have mentioned a few different collective models that have um, either been established or emerging um, that rely on different aspects of, um, of these kind of drivers of collective action. Um, the first, which I think we can now call effectively an altruism-based collective model, which relies on pro-social behavior on the part of libraries and contributors, is a scope three model, um, which is uh, managed by us at CERN. I'll talk about that in detail in a moment. And then um, other conditional open models, which work with incentives, where provision of a public resource is made contingent on upfront investments and commitments of support, um, but also provides private incentives that are exclusive to participants. And in that context, I'll mention the subscribe to open model and direct to open model of MIT Press. Um, and finally, I'm going to uh, quickly mention a cost sharing approach, um, which uses a community support model to transition away from APCs um, while making collective participation cost effective. And there I'll be talking about the community action publishing model of PLOS. So um, <clears throat> now in altruism based collective models, um, the sustained support of scope three is what I'm calling it now, because really what we're talking about is an initiative that is almost into its uh, 10th year of operation. Um, it's a, it was a global collaboration, which was launched in 2014, um, and is an international collective of over 3000 institutions from 44 countries, um, and includes leading journal publishers, and those include commercial publishers, foreign OA, and society publishers. As of this morning, Scope 3, um, which is a sponsoring consortium for open access, access publishing and particle physics has published 48,261 articles. We hope to reach the 50,000 mark in the next couple of months. Um, and although this participation is um, funded and supported by 44 countries, that's a, uh, a nice healthy number, um, there are beneficiaries from over 120 countries. And that means that authors from over 120 countries around the world have been able to publish in the scope three journals and to do it with absolutely no APC. So how are um, financial contributions to scope three determined? Effectively, what we do is we look at the body of literature in high energy physics and we, we look at it over a two year period. And we try and calculate the relative fraction of authorship of articles in, in the discipline per country. So, um, if an article has more than one author, we try and calculate the pro rata share. Um, so we look at, um, let's say there's an, an article, um, this example given below um, with Pavarotti, Mozart and um, Mickey Mouse, that um, if, if the author's affiliation is Italy, as, it, as with Mr. Pavarotti, um, a fraction is assigned to him. Um, if Mozart who has affiliations with Greece and with Denmark, uh, and with Germany, excuse me, we assign um, the, the fraction of the authorship to the country with the highest GDP. And so that would go to Germany. And if an author has an affiliation, which includes CERN, we assign that fraction to CERN. So what we do is we do this across every single article that's published in the discipline uh, and supported by scope three over a two year period. We calculate for every single article, the proportional fraction for every author and for every country. We add that up on a country level to calculate the fraction of authorship of the literature that belongs to that country. 
And we multiply that by the total budget of scope three uh, in order to understand, in order to get a number um, that is a target financial contribution for that country. So in effect, we're looking at the cost of providing the, uh, the open access publishing services, the proportional use of that service by a country, and then um, kind of calculating um, how much that should be. We ask countries to add an additional 10% of their allocation to cover countries that uh, cannot reasonably expect it to contribute. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got 120 countries, many LMICs that participate, um, and other countries do help fund their share. So scope three has, uh, since its operation, effectively flipped the discipline of higher energy physics entirely to open access. And although there have been concerns over free ridership, they have not borne out. And instead, support for the collaboration continues to grow. We had uh, Ireland join us um, last year, and we have a couple of countries in the pipeline that will be joining us this year. So um, rather than seeing free ridership, we're actually seeing more institutions joining. But why hasn't this model been replicated? So um, as collective action theory demonstrates, um, coordinated action um, based on altruism can work, but typically only really works in smaller groups. With scope three, it's a global cooperative um, across, as I mentioned already, 44 countries. Coordinating that collective support um, takes a lot of time, money, and investment. And CERN made that investment initially. Um, it took Salvatore Mele a number of years of traveling around the world advocating for Scope 3 to build the group and to build the collective. Um, and obviously there are costs associated with maintaining and sustaining the operations that are also met by CERN. So this model really hasn't been replicated, um, although it, we have achieved a global fit for the display itself. Um, likely because no other organization has been able to kind of step up and play that role across another discipline. Uh, it would be interesting to see if anyone would, or if we could leverage the existing structure of scope three um, to see if we can sustain um, or uh, you know, add other disciplines um, into the work that we're doing. And um, next year we'll be exploring uh, potentially extending or expanding the scope of scope three, and um, we'll see if that will actually um, bear out. The next um, model that I wanted to talk about is a conditional open model with incentives. So this is one where um, access to the resource is made conditional, so it's not guaranteed, um, but participants are provided with incentives. So the model that I'm going to be talking about first is subscribe to open. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it was developed initially by annual reviews working with Rain Crow. And the model is really used <clears throat> to try and take the existing subscription relationships um, between the publisher and subscribing institutions and see if you can use those relationships to um, uh, build support to convert the resource to open. Now, the model um, aims to provide a, an adequate local incentive for institutions to participate. So that means that um, there's a conditional incentive for participating institutions. Uh, it needs to ensure that institutions continue to participate over, over time. Um, it also needs to satisfy institutional procurement policies that forbid donative payments. So um, it needs to, th this model was designed with the need to very much be interpreted as a subscription so that subscription dollars could be used rather than relying necessarily on, on open access funds that libraries may or may not have. And also aims to, to kind of preserve the vendor customer relationship and, uh, and, and to leverage that relationship rather than relying on an altruistic collective contribution. So I think the, the easiest way of understanding this is to see what, um, what this looks like. So in an invoice that would go to um, a library for a specific journal, and this was where the, the um, incentive was a discount, which was initially what annual reviews had done, was offering a 5% discount on 
um, on subscriptions for participating members. This is what it looks like um, in a presentation. So um, we would, uh, excuse me, it should, that should say subscribe to open for 2023, excuse me. Um, so for the next year, uh, we would subscribe to open, receive a 5% discount. We understand that open access is only guaranteed if all subscribers participate. And we will receive the 5% discount even if the content remains gated. So this means that participants continue to receive the discount regardless of the outcome, but it also communicates that everyone needs to participate. So as, a, as an institution, you should be able to look at this and think the only way that I can guarantee that my institution will have access is if I subscribe, because there's this uh, you know, condition that all subscribers should participate. Um, and so that means that if, if you do have demand for the content, and because this offer is targeted towards existing subscribers who we know already have demand, that, um, that in incentivizes them if they want to have the content, the only way to guarantee that they have it is if they participate and they'll also receive a discount. So um, in effect, it remains a subscription and um, participating institutions benefit from an incentive. So again, it targets the journal's current subscriber base using existing um, procurement processes. It motivates participation by economic self-interest and avoids reliance on altruism and pro-collective behavior. The offer needs to be repeated annually to ensure ongoing participation and stable revenue. Um, different publishers are looking at at offering subscribe to open offers for multiple years now. So um, I think one of the important things to mention about subscribe to open is that it was not designed as a universal solution for, for open access, but it was designed as a mechanism for publishers who may not have, um, uh, who may be risk averse and for whom other OA solutions may not be obvious. Um, annual reviews is one of them, as it you know has uh, publishes review journals that um, that are um, commissioned articles. So the APC model wouldn't necessarily work for them. Um, the list of publishers that are offering subscribe to open is expanding, um, and the mechanisms for incentives are differing. Um, what we're now seeing is that the offering a discount isn't necessarily thought to be the um, the the way to go um, or the most popular way and, and that actually um, libraries are benefiting from um, reciprocal access. So um, one set of libraries may be subscribing to one journal, another may be subscribing to another. And for libraries that, that don't exist in the overlap, um, they're getting access to other journals that have flipped open um, via subscribe to open offers, and that is uh, proving to be an additional benefit for them, which is driving their participation. There's a community of practice of, um, of other publishers that are joining this model and a list of journals that's linked um, in this presentation. Another model that's working on similar principles is the direct to open uh, model by MIT Press, which is aiming to convert the front list of their monographs to open access. Um, they've broken the, the upcoming monograph um, titles into two subject collections. So one in the social sciences and humanities, another, another in the sciences, which offers lower participation costs and allows more institutions to participate. They've set tiered participation fees for each institution that are low relative to the value that, um, uh, that uh, um, institutions might have, um, uh, might have placed in, um, in subscribing to, to actual books or purchasing books. Um, it makes the opening the front list contingent on the offer for reaching a specific financial support threshold. So again, it's a contingent offer um, because pricing is lower relative to what institutions might have paid. They have a financial incentive and um, that uh, there's an additional incentive of, of the monograph back file for institutions that commit their support to the offer. Uh, even if the collective front left offer were to fail. So participating institutions do have an additional benefit. 
Um, MIT Press has recently announced that they've already reached the 50% participation threshold against their three-year target. Over 160 libraries have committed, including a number of large consortia and their full list of spring 2022 monographs and edited collections um, is uh, they've announced will be published open access. Finally, I want to talk about a, uh, <coughs> another innovative approach, um, which is adopted by PLOS, um, particularly interesting because they're transitioning away from APC funded support for OA to collective funding. Um, they're pursuing a model which is designed to support their highly selective titles, um, PLOS Biology, PLOS Medicine, and now, and now PLOS Sustainability and Transformation. They have looked at the authorship across these journals and been able to calculate um, a kind of collective contribution that, um, that publishing institutions might want to make, um, kind of in a similar way to, to the way that Scope 3 works, um, but rather than looking at the country level, looking at an institutional level, um, and coming up with an annual fee for institutions, which would provide them with unlimited, uncapped publishing um, in the journals. And the fees are tiered based on their publishing activity. So this is kind of what that looks like. Um, you can have a kind of more, more detailed look on their website as well. Um, they also have non-member fees, which is in effect kind of an APC that, that authors would have to pay if they were not members. These fees tend to be higher than what the um, institutional annual fee would be to participate. So again, there's this kind of financial incentive or financial disincentive built into not participating. And the aim for PLOS with kind of um, publishing transparently their revenue targets is um, to kind of reach this collective, um, reach these targets through collective contributions in the next three to four years, ultimately eliminating all of the charges for both journals and having completely equitable, open to read and open to publish um, uh, model for, for all of the journals that are in this community action publishing program. So finally, um, I've covered quite a lot of ground and done it quite quickly, so thank you for bearing with me. What we may have experienced in scholarly communications was, you know, rather than a tragedy of the commons, a tragedy of the anti-commons, as described by Michael Heller, where the imposition of excessive property, property rights on intellectual resources resulted in socially suboptimal use of scientific knowledge. But now we are seeing collective action approaches that are kind of uh, bucking this trend. And um, to the extent that um, these are um, introduced and implemented by um, value-based organizations who are willing to be transparent around their approaches um, and share a common set of principles, we really hope to, to see um, a more equitable, cost-efficient um, approach towards global um, open access, um, which is uh, sustainable um, and inclusive for um, authors all around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, we've got a few questions. Um, I don't see any in the room at the moment, but if you're in the room and would like to ask a question, just walk up to a microphone and then I'll call you out. Um, so one from Nicola, Nicole Ramsey online. On scope three, who specifically pays, say, Germany's share? Is this at the government level, for example? So that's a really good question. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, it really varies, um, in each country. So, um, uh, in Germany, as an example, um, TIB, um, which is kind of one of the, the large national libraries is the coordinating entity and, um, they coordinate contributions across a consortium of institutions. Um, in the UK, as an example, we have a partnership um, both with JISC and with STFC. And so um, part of the contribution comes from contributing libraries across JISC and part of the financial contribution comes from UKRI, um, STFC. And so it really varies by country. 
Um, so in scope three, really what we've done is to try and calculate what a, a, a country's target contribution should be, identified uh, a partner in each country, and then it's up to them to really kind of figure out how to fund the share. Um, and, it, and it really tends to vary. Predominantly, it's um, done by um, participation by libraries, um, but there does tend to be a mix, um, sometimes between libraries and funder support as well. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Andrea Powell about scope three. Do the members or funders of CERN have any concerns about the sustainability of the scope three system? Um, I would say the sustainability is always kind of a concern. And um, what we are um, looking to do actually this year um, and actually what we're required to do is to develop a new um, tender process for scope three because um, the existing tender had um, been created more than 10 years ago. And um, according to certain procurement rules, we now have to kind of re-tender for, um, for scope three. We'll see how that, that process goes and, 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 and what we end up doing. Um, it's very early stages now. But um, the, I think what I can say is that the, um, so CERN has an open access policy which requires that all of our research outputs are, are published OA. And if we were to pay APCs for each of those articles, um, the financial contribution would be much higher than our existing contribution through, um, through scope three. So um, in terms of sustainability, I think CERN has a, an, an interest, a very strong interest in, um, in sustaining the operations of scope three. We'd like to continue to, um, to do what we've done in terms of making a, a globally equitable model with, um, with no barriers for readership or for publishing. Um, and we'd like to do that in, in the most financially efficient way. So sustainability is a concern. Um, you know, we, we hope to be able to, to, at the minimum, sustain what we're doing, but you know, also uh, hopefully do something more progressive moving forward as well. Great, thank you. We've had one question on, online that seems to have already been answered by someone else online, which is rather good, but uh, maybe I'll read it out anyway. Um, so Aaron Custer said, what happens on subscribe to open if the quotas are met in one year? Oh, hang on. Um, it flips to open, but then not in the following years. Um, and then, yeah. shall I just read out what uh, Rod Cookson said to answer it and then see if uh, sure. Cameron agrees? Uh, so, uh, all articles published in the year should be CC by BY and will remain OA in perpetuity, the journal would revert to being a subscriber-only title. Kamran, do you agree with that? Uh, I, I do agree, actually. And that's, and, and that's kind of the, uh, again, you know, one of the, I guess, like one of the disincentives that's, that's built into the model. I don't think anyone really wants for, for a title to revert back um, to paywall. Um, but uh, logically speaking, yeah, kind of any year where the offer has been successful, the content will um, be licensed CC by and remain that way in perpetuity. But if if it fails in a subsequent year, um, then that year's content would remain paywalled. Um, and then hopefully, you know, folks would realize that yeah, you know, if if you know we do want um, the content to be open, um, that you know their participation is necessary. Um, and obviously, you know, what it would also imply, right, with subscribe to open is that sub because it's built on subscribers continuing to, to participate, that if, if a certain number of subscribers decide, oh, well, we'll see if it, you know, we'll just kind of flip to open anyway, um, and we won't subscribe, then the content won't be published away. And that would mean that they would have to, um, you know, subscribe to the closed version later, which would not be discounted um, if they want, if they indeed wanted access um, as they previously had had. So there's a kind of disincentive built in that way. But the answer indeed is correct. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Heather Staines in the room. Uh, hi, 
Hi, Cameron. Um, thanks, Hi, for your, thanks for your presentation and thanks for, for being a trooper and presenting, even though you're clearly not feeling 100%. Um, we have a lot of people interested in OA books. I'm in the process of running a workshop here online um, with some other folks. And I believe, if I remember correctly, Scope has recently started looking at books. I know your presentation was mainly on the journal side, but even though it's early days, what could you tell us about scope for books? What kind of feedback are you getting? Uh, anything that would be helpful for the folks here who are interested? Sure. Um, there is a scope three for books collection on the OAPEN uh, website. Um, if you have a look at it, um, I believe there's already 22 titles that we have um, we've flipped. So we're, we, we've entered into partnerships with um, five different publishers. Um, so it includes Taylor and Francis, Springer Nature, Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press. Um, we'll be flipping uh, over 100 um, books in the discipline of higher energy physics. And this includes monographs and textbooks um, to full OA. Um, this initiative was also interesting because it was, again, kind of a, um, an, an altruistic um, appeal. Um, across the, the scope three um, uh, group of libraries. It was entirely voluntary. Um, we had kind of an initial financial package estimate um, that we um, actually exceeded by more than double um, by voluntary contributions from participants. Um, I think, you know, the pandemic also really kind of um, further motivated libraries to to want to invest in, in making important textbooks um, freely available to everybody. So um, yeah, we're, we've, we've entered into agreements with with publishers and, um, and as books are being flipped to open, they are um, made available on on the Awaken site and um, they're fully accessible. Like I said, I think there's about 22 of them there now and about another 100 to go. Thank you. I think we have Rob Johnson in the room. Hi, yeah, Rob Johnson, Research Consulting. Thank you, Cameron, Hi, for a really interesting talk. Um, I, I guess I, just, I was just interested to get your take on a, a couple of things I'd seen over the last year or two. So there was an interesting story recently, or a, a study rather, showing that the, the share of low and middle income country authors on open access papers was lower than on subscription papers, which I think kind of illustrates the value of these APC free models. But we also know there was a study done by Science Europe, I think last year, that actually APC based open access is growing much faster than kind of APC free or, or diamond models. So it feels like, you know, this is potentially a really valuable solution that increases equity, but actually what's happening at a macro level is this is shrinking. You know, APC free models are shrinking as a share of the total market. So I was just interested as to whether you see prospects for that kind of changing or whether we have to kind of accept this is always going to be, I guess, a niche part of a, the, the bigger picture. Um, that's a That's a great question. And, um, somewhat depressing as well. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, no, 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 but I, 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 think, I think you're very right. Um, you know, I, I think particularly the, the kind of proliferation of, of RMP deals um, that are primarily based around, you know, APCs as, as units um, is, is really kind of helping to drive that, the trend in that direction. Um, you know, I, I I hope that, that this that this that this weren't niche. I think that the reality is is that because um, so much of, of scholarship is controlled by um, you know larger publishers that are pursuing these these APC based approaches, that yeah they're going to dominate the trend. But um, it's nice to see at least that there are there are different approaches emerging. Um, you know, I'd I'd like to see um, other publishers that are interested in sustainable. Um, equitable approaches to OA start to adopt some of these approaches as we're, as we're seeing, you know, there's more of a community building around subscribe to open and, and you know, more people kind of exploring these, um, these, uh, you know, progressive collective approaches. Um, you know, I think we're just going to have to see it, you know, I, I do worry though that, um, that this will be um, a, a niche activity, but I think it's, 
it's also up to the community to to make some decisions around where they want to invest um, their money, whether um, whether it is with these these larger um, deals or whether they're willing to um, kind of push back against that trend and start to um, explore more collective approaches. Thank you. Um, we've got a question uh, online from Rod Cookson. What practical steps can be taken to make evolving models like Subscribe to Open persistent and to demonstrate to potential supporters that Subscribe to Open will continue for the long term? Um, that's a, another, another very good question. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting work going on in the subscribe to open community of practice and um, I haven't been part of the recent discussion, so I don't want to um, kind of over represent my, my knowledge of, of, of where it's heading. But I do think that that there are kind of there's kind of potential for subscribe to open offers to be coordinated um, across publishers. Um, as I mentioned, there's this kind of reciprocal benefit that that institutions can get that may subscribe to one set um, you know, to content from one publisher and other institutions may subscribe to content from another. And if you can coordinate those, then the benefit that that each set of institutions get is is, is bigger because they all get um, you know kind of increased access to content. Um, so I think there's a you know there's a potential to to kind of coordinate those offers or how that would work is is complex and I know that um, you know, the, in the community of practice, people are exploring this kind of work. Um, you know, I do think that the subscribe to open is a, um, you know, it is a relatively new model. Um, how long it's going to um, be viable for um, is is questionable. I think we'll see. Um, you know, I don't I don't think we've seen any particular offer from. A subscribe to open publisher fail just yet um, in a given year. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out and and whether or not um, you know the the kind of the economics of of these kind of subscribe to open offers in terms of you know the value that institutions use to place on reading access um, is is the is the right kind of economic unit that institutions will continue to want to support moving forward um, and. Yeah, in a sense, it kind of worked with um, with scope three at the very beginning because um, you know what at the beginning of scope three institutions essentially took what they what they paid in subscriptions and used that as a um, as the contribution um, that would fund their sustained um, uh, participation in scope three. So in effect, there was kind of this kind of like subscribe to open element to it, but now it's shifted. Um, now that the resources have continued to be open to be based on authorship. And so, you know, when that shift will happen for subscribe to open offers or what direction that shift will take um, will be interesting. But, you know, I think that the question really becomes is, you know, once you have a resource and it becomes open and stays open for a long time, like what is the right way, of, right sustainable way of funding it? And um, I think for the, the publishers that are, are in subscribe to open, um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, kind of how that pans out over time. But I don't, I don't think we, we, we have a good answer for it just now. Great. I don't see any more questions. I wonder if I could ask you uh, to go back to the part about the tragedy of the commons. I was really glad to hear that there are, uh, that there are debates about this issue and that it's not inevitable and that the person who described it has got some uh, dubious attitudes, to say the least. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the opposite, the comedy of the commons. How, how is it that resources can become more useful the more people use them? Could you say a bit more about that? Sure. I mean, we should really kind of leave this up to, um, up to the real common scholars in the group, and I, I, I won't claim myself as one of them. But I think you know, scientific knowledge is, is, is clearly one of those resources that... Um, that that will become more useful the more people use them you know science um uh relies on um on people kind of utilizing applying and, and then continuing to contribute towards um knowledge and so um to the extent that 
that that scientific knowledge could be made available for free, I think comedy of the commons can ensue and should ensue, um, where the knowledge will become more um, more uh, more useful and more valuable to the community. The more the more people can read and the more people can contribute. Um, you know, I had, I had the really unfortunate um, uh, situation happen to me quite recently, where we had uh, um, a diagnosis in my family of you know, one of my nephews was diagnosed with a very rare rare cancer, and in wanting to learn about it, I discovered how limited my own, you know, even you know, being at a privileged institution like CERN. Um, how limited my own access was to knowledge and and how fearful it actually made me of not being able to to um, to access the current thinking on or the current science the current thinking about treatments and approaches and um, and you know then made me realize you know, in kind of a more real way um, how how people um, around the world um, particularly in resource deprived communities must feel um, when trying to access uh, you know, current science on, on you know whatever um, you know whatever disease might be inflicting someone in their family or in their community, and um, and there really has to be a better way of us um, of us organizing science. And um, I think you know if we can kind of pursue these collective um, approaches, um, it will be better not just for you know for us as individuals and. Um, our families, but also more broadly for our communities. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a future I, I hope to see in my lifetime. Great. Well, thank you very much, Cameron. I think that's, uh, we've run out of questions for now and we've got only a minute or two to go. So is that, uh, unless there's more questions, um, if anyone's got a quick one. <laughs> okay. No? Well, I will... Um, call that a day and um, I now thank can't you. remember what, exactly what's happening next but thank you very much Cameron. Thank you. Thank you all for bearing with me.